Right. Welcome, everyone. We are so excited that you're here. Uh, my name is Kimberly Dubois, and I am on the Enterprise Partnerships team here at Dreambox Learning. Uh, we have an exciting hour of learning for everyone who's joining us. Uh, we'll probably get started in about one minute, uh, knowing that it's a hectic afternoon every day for educators. Uh, so we'll let some late joiners uh, jump on with us. Um, we do have with us, of course, our Chief Learning Officer, uh, Dr. Tim Hudson, who's going to be moderating today. And we're thrilled with two incredible Georgia educators uh, and leaders uh, that will be our panelists this afternoon. We've got Dr. Barrow from Fayette County Schools in Georgia. And he'll tell you a little bit about himself in just a moment. And also Dr. Brian Lack uh, from Forsyth County Schools. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have them as partners uh, here on the Dreambox team. Um, but of course, we are much more focused on talking about personalized learning this afternoon. Um, so some of the things that we're gonna touch on is, you know, first and foremost, what, what does personalized learning look like for these two districts? Um, because it's certainly not one size fits all. And how does that really fit into um, our larger goals as educators, um, specifically here in Georgia? When we think about the Georgia Department of Education and the work that we're all focused on, um, there's a real big focus here on the whole child. Um, and so that can look really different in every district, um, but the Department of Ed here in Georgia wants us to focus on and allow for our districts to build students who are ready to learn, ready to live, and ready to lead. Um, so we'll see how personalized learning fits in with that today. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Tim. All right, thanks so much, Kimberly. And thank you to uh, uh, all of you who've joined us today to attend and, and learn a little bit more and participate with us. Before we get to, it's going to be mostly a conversation for the next hour that we're going to have. We have a few questions that are going to tee up and start a conversation and definitely encourage everyone who's, uh, who's on the webinar to use the chat feature and go to webinar. It should be available for you to type in some questions and we want this to be pretty active, uh, interactive, pretty conversational. We know that your time is valuable. We wanna make sure you get the most out of it. And to get started, <clears throat> I'm gonna share, uh, as Kimberly said, a little bit of a definition of personalized learning and then we'll have uh, Dr. Barrow and Dr. Lack introduce themselves. So to start, uh, hopefully you're seeing my slides move. Yeah, looks good. So if you're leading personalized learning initiatives, a key question that helps with like buy-in, getting everyone rallied around it. Um, you know, Kimberly mentioned about, you know, we want students to have great outcomes, to, to live, to learn, to lead, all those things. It's helpful to ask the question, if personalized learning is the solution, then what is the problem? That we don't want uh, personalized learning to be a solution in need of a problem. So here are a few things that, in my experience as a high school math teacher and K-12 math director, uh, from suburban St. Louis, these are some things that I've found are problems in need of solutions. So let's say today in class, the lesson is fraction addition. And let's say it's a, it's a one room schoolhouse, uh, nine students. And even within a small group setting, you have kids who are thinking, this is too hard. It doesn't make sense. I give up. You have students thinking, I didn't learn anything new at all this year. It's a boring math class. Sometimes, ideally, we get the sweet spot of this is not too hard, not too easy, the just right Goldilocks scenario. So this is one, this is one challenge that we have in every classroom. Another challenge is uh, the, the pedagogical aspect that you've got a student thinking math is boring, it's just lecture, practice, practice lecture, practice, quiz. This is how a lot of people experience math. And uh, math is far more rich than that. It's a whole sense-making kind of experience and not just a sit and get. We want it to be a think and do uh, thing for students because kids are brilliant and we want to empower that brilliance. We have students who think, you know what? It makes sense when my teacher shows me how to do it, but I'm lost when I get home. Uh, that's another thing we want personalized learning to address. And then certainly, uh, if uh, I know this was me at some points in my K-12 math career. I know how to do well at school. I just wait for the teacher to show me how to do familiar problems. And, uh, and then I know those are the ones on the test. So kind of maybe skating by and not really being an empowered mathematician. And part of the question is, you know, why is today's lesson fraction addition for these nine students or 
in reality, 30 students, right, for a typical fourth grade class in our country. And it's because we still have a tendency in many places and, and cases to just put students into classrooms based on how old they are, which is not a great data point for deciding what students are going to learn. We understand that it's a logistical challenge to figure out how to you know, educate all students and we don't want to be tracking them or setting up redbirds or bluebird groups really. However, we should be a little more thoughtful about how we're deciding what students are learning over the course of a school year. And that's where personalized learning can help because teachers are thinking, look, we have these seat time policies, the pacing calendar, the standardized tests, age-based classrooms, weak competency-based models, all of these things make it difficult for teachers to personalize and to differentiate. A lot of times teachers think differentiation means I need to make 30 different lessons for 30 different students. That's something that a technology like Dreambox can help with, but in reality, we want teachers to be focused on community, on the social aspect of mathematics, on trying to do things that can only be done when a group of uh, kids and a talented, caring educator are together doing mathematics. So uh, another key point, uh, there's a great report out there that uh, I would suggest you check out from Education Trust about uh, middle school math assignment analysis where they found that very few middle school math assignments push student thinking to higher levels. Only 3% gave students choice in their assignments. That's a key part of personalized learning. And only 2% of tasks were relevant to student experiences. So these are all things about how do we make math more personal and personalized. We need to give students more agency. We need to give them tasks that make sense in their context. And so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do this definition of personalized learning, take about five more minutes on this part, just so we all have a shared framing uh, of what personalized learning is. And this is a definition uh, that I came up with when my wife and I, when she was pregnant with our first child, uh, we went to what back then they called a natural childbirth class. Importantly, we don't wanna call it natural. Um, because that implies like what they meant was unmedicated, but like natural is the wrong word. Uh, all births are de by definition natural. So this was really unmedicated childbirth course. It was six three hour evening sessions, six weeks long. There were uh, six couples in our class. It was voluntary, it was self-funded, we paid for it. You would think these are the optimal conditions for personalized learning. We're invested, we care, we're highly motivated to learn in this class. <clears throat> so. We're, we go through three weeks of the class. It's the fourth week, and uh, the instructor tells us, okay, now we're going to watch the videos of natural childbirth. And uh, just one of those, this is kind of how the conversation went down. This is a dramatization. It's not what me and my wife looked like at the time, but we're, wa we're watching these videos, and I lean over to my wife, and I say, why are they yelling so much? <laughs> to which she replies, because giving birth is painful, which I obviously knew. So I said, well, yeah, I get that. Why don't they just take some pain killing medication? At which point she kind of was rightly not too happy with me. She's like, this is the whole point of the class. OMG, this is the fourth week. Where have you even been? We're not gonna use medication. And it occurred to me at that point that even though the situation seemed like the right kind of personalized learning, there was a problem. Four weeks in, I as a student had not gotten a big idea uh, of the course. So I came up with this framework. Uh, you've got things that are either personal or impersonal. It's as simple as that, sort of like a opposite ends of the spectrum. And then you have these two important distinctions. You have the learning, which is pedagogy, and you have the schooling, which are the structures that we as adults set up. So as I walk through this, Personal schooling is kind of about what are you ready to learn? I was ready to learn about uh, childbirth, unmedicated childbirth. But the thing that was kind of missing was the personalized learning. What do I think about it? Up until week four, my brain had not been activated enough to where I even got the biggest idea in the class that we were not going to be using medication. Uh, that was worth my wife's choice. Um, this is more of a when you were born. That's sort of an impersonal schooling that all that matters is your birthday. And then impersonal learning is a pedagogy where you're just telling kids what to think. And that's how a lot of people experience math class. 
So we have actually four different quadrants, personalized schooling, personalized learning, impersonal schooling, impersonal learning. And just to give you a couple of examples, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Apollo 13, where they have to figure out how to literally put a round filter in a square hole, that's very much a personal learning thing. There is no clear answer. These folks are ready, these scientists were ready to learn how to solve that problem, and they were gonna tackle it. What do they think about it? That's the only way they can solve the problem. Whereas Goodwill Hunting, if you remember the how do you like them apples uh, scene with this character, he basically is trying to plagiarize all these different history textbooks that he's been reading as a student. And <laughs> Matt Damon's character comes up and, and, you know, calls him out for plagiarizing and telling him, well, of course you think that right now because you've just read this book, but next semester you're going to read that book and it's going to, and then you're going to like, he ends this whole thing by asking, do you have any thoughts of your own on this matter? And that's an impersonal learning situation because this individual in his classes, he, he wasn't thinking for himself. He was just going with what he was told to think in these grad courses semester after semester. So uh, I'll give a quick math example. Um, let's say a student is ready or wants to learn about dividing fractions. I'm not sure why I'm ready. If they're ready, let's do it then we could say, okay, you're ready to divide fractions. We could jump to giving that student a packet. Maybe they're accelerating. We're like, hey, tell you what, yours is not to reason why, just invert and multiply. That's how you do these problems and move on. Well, that robs students of the opportunity to think about uh, dividing fractions. They haven't done anything other than follow some rule. And uh, hopefully that's not how you learn, uh, for those of you on the call, Hopefully that's not how you learn fraction division, but for many students it was. What we want to do, a more personalized learning approach, is to give kids sense-making experiences where, like that Education Trust uh, data showed, where the problems are relevant to kids' experiences and they have some choice about how they're gonna solve the problem and figure it out. Of course, the impersonal schooling says, hey, the pacing calendar says all sixth graders get the fraction division unit in March. That's, that's how things are typically done. So um, let me go ahead and I'm going to pause here to now bring our panelists uh, into the conversation and start to, start to tackle some questions about personalized learning now that I've put a little framework out there for everyone to consider. I'll wrap up at the end with a little bit about Dreambox. But uh, here we go. I'd like to introduce you. You've been seeing them on the video to Dr. Barrow and Dr. Lack, and uh, I'd like you guys to just introduce yourselves, and we'll start with you, Dr. Barrow. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tim, and um, after your presentation, I think I'm done. I, I've learned everything I need to know, so well done. Um, my name is Joseph Barrow. I'm superintendent of schools here in Fayette County, Georgia, just southwest of Atlanta. Uh, the, the official name is Joseph, but please feel free to call me Jody if you have questions. Um, I'm completing my seventh year here in uh, Fayette County, uh, but actually, believe it or not, I know I look real young, but uh, this is my 40th year in education and uh, just uh, recently announced my official retirement from the superintendency. I'll continue to uh, work in education in some other areas, but uh, I was delighted to be able to uh, come and, and talk about uh, well, certainly Dreambox specifically, but about the things that we think are important as far as teaching and learning. That's really uh, the heart and soul of what we do. I wear a superintendent's hat, but I'm still a teacher at heart and uh, excited to be here. Uh, I appreciate your definition of uh, personalized learning. I think if you ask 10 people what personalized learning is, you'll get 10 different answers. And we've been working to try to come to some consistent applications and definitions of that in our own district. Um, I, I think uh, just very globally here um, in talking about the business of education, we've talked about personalizing the learning experience for children forever. And good teachers have been able to pull in parts of that um, to, to certain levels of success. but. Uh, I, I really believe with uh, the things that we can do today in technology, I really do believe that we can master personalizing the learning experience for our young people. Um, but it's not as easy as putting it, uh, a screen in front of a child. That's not what we want to be able to do. 
Uh, and there are other issues about that, and I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, when we get into the questions. But personalization, the, uh, the issue of blended applications, and certainly competency-based learning, all of those are factors in how we're getting our head wrapped around uh, the best uh, pedagogy, the best uh, teaching and learning for our young people. No, I, excellent, excellent point. Yeah, importantly, that definition doesn't say anything about technology, uh, that it's really about you know, what tools can we bring to bear in order to make these sorts of things happen. So, hey, congratulations on your, on your retirement, and thank you for uh, uh, spending some time with us today. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Lack, over to you for a, uh, an introduction. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Brian Lack. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on this panel, um, Tim, and it's great to meet you, Dr. Barrow. I have exactly half uh, the years of experience as you. I've just hit year 20, so um, I, I, I hope I can get another 20 in. Uh, that would be a great thing <laughs> if uh, coronavirus doesn't get me first. <laughs> so, um, so I've been a, a teacher. Half my career has been in elementary, middle school. I taught kindergarten, fourth, fifth, um, and uh, EIP third grade math. Um, and then I also spent uh, about five or six years in middle school teaching sixth grade math. And uh, the other half of my career I've spent in higher ed and um, also the last seven years as a district uh, math content specialist in Forsyth County Schools. We actually heard about Dreambox from um, friends of ours, colleagues of ours in Fayette County. And so um, the last four years, we have been carefully um, piloting in several target uh, schools. And this is our first year of a full 100% uh, implementation in all of our elementary schools. And we're using it with uh, great success. So I can't wait to share our story. All right, thank you so much. I think the first place we want to start, we always like to talk about uh, at Dreambox, our, our math stories. We all were students once. All of us have uh, some experience as a math student. And uh, share part of your personal math story. What do you remember from math class as a student? Good stuff or bad stuff? Um, yeah, how old were you when you really started having opinions about yourself as a mathematician? Dr. Barrow, we'll start with you. Um, okay. Sure. I, I was going to say, Brian, you're younger. Your memory's better than mine. So go ahead. Why don't you answer that one first? Okay. All right, sure. So um, my experience was like one of the kids you showed in the beginning, Tim, uh, the one that uh, had the experience of lecture practice, lecture practice, quiz test. Um, math was um, always easy for me, though. And so I, I liked it. It didn't really bother me. Um, I made A's. I was on my school's competition math team. Um, throughout middle school and high school. And as a kid, I knew I wanted to go to Georgia Tech and become an engineer. And I started in Georgia Tech, was there for one quarter before I realized I want to be a math teacher. So I got out of there. And it wasn't until I began, began teaching uh, with a program called Everyday Mathematics um, the first uh, few years of my career that I finally it finally hit me that I was good at doing math, but I didn't understand any of the procedures or rules that I had learned in elementary, middle, or high school. And so um, that's one reason why I'm very passionate about Dreambox with its emphasis on uh, conceptual um, understanding. Um, my experience with math is a, a little bit different. We did it back in the days when the abacus was, was, were still used and uh, uh, arithmetic uh, ruled the world. And um, uh, I always did okay in math and, and certainly had great appreciation for it. Uh, I think um, uh, as I became older, I, it was more about practitioner uh, math and, and what it could do for me. My father was in, it was a contractor, and of course I had to know math about how to figure out square footage and uh, building and, and painting and, and those kinds of things within the uh, contract business. So it was more application math, and uh, that always served me well. And uh, you know, even as uh, as an administrator and a superintendent who ha handles a multi-million dollar business, we deal with large numbers, um, but it's still uh, application math and arithmetic. And uh, uh, I know that uh, math is 
is much more than that, and we've come to master that and understand it. In fact, I um, uh, worked as an elementary principal and, and did my uh, research on my dissertation basically with math manip manipulative, uh, manipulatives, thank you, and uh, how that um, could help uh, with the learning process, hands-on opportunities. So, um, but uh, we, we do have a, a lot of young people um, that can handle much higher levels of math and application and uh, I think that's critically important, particularly as we become more technology oriented in our in our society. Uh, math and science is absolutely critical uh, in the STEM and STEAM fields. And uh, so we want to be able to uh, help our young people be able to do higher levels of math. And we understand how to make that happen through our uh, curriculum alignment and design. So um, math is is really another language and it's being able to help people or young people to understand it's how you communicate uh, particularly when you look at coding and, and computer science and those things uh, it's a different language and those that can master the math language uh, really in my opinion are going to have a uh, an edge in the future coming economies yeah it's it's interesting you, you mentioned that because when i think about the whole like yours is not to reason why just invert multiply like there are ways to make sense of why that works and it's logical because math is dealing with logical things it's not the same as like in english when you say i before e except after c no language doesn't always make sense right it's a whole different deal and with math every kid can be empowered because it makes sense we just have to create that situation where they get it that way um i remember in first grade we had like the little cubes and then the rods of 10 and then the flat discs of 100 and then the cube of a thousand for those of you who are like star trek fans it looked like the board cube but the problem was it was up on the shelf in our in the corner of the room and we never had a chance to like manipulate it to just hold it and i just wanted to behold that thing of a thousand and be like "Ooh, look at this um but i always enjoyed math uh except when i got second place on the time third grade test so that's another story all right, so thank you for sharing some of your story. And, and every day, I'm, it's not lost on me that you know billions of children around the world are having some math experience. And our goal is to make sure it's a great experience and they all feel like they can do it because as you mentioned, Dr. Barrow, it's important to their, to their success. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, Dr. Barrow, back to you for this one. What are some of the toughest challenges facing your district sort of overall right now? And the next question will specifically get into elementary mathematics. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think I can say this is probably the case with Fayette and with Forsyth. Um, I, you know, and, and we have some very good school districts in Georgia across the state, but Fayette and Forsyth typically are, uh, the old farmer would say, they're bell cows in, in our state. They are leaders with uh, innovative practice. They're leaders in uh, performance and, and our young people uh, literally can go pretty much anywhere in the world and be successful educationally. So uh, uh, it, and that reputation is uh, very well deserved. Um, but one of our uh, one of our issues here and, and something that we've worked on is um, not everybody's going to go to an Ivy League university and uh, uh, although they may be academically capable of going to school anywhere, uh, at the end of the day, we feel like you need to take your passion and be able to hopefully apply it to a job setting. And um, some of our issues are uh, trying to figure out how to uh, not um, uh, undersell uh, the academic rigor because we want to be academic rigorous. Uh, but how we apply that in, in the world that's changing, the economic structure that's changing. So we're beginning to have uh, conversations with uh, uh, industry leaders and uh, people all around the state. Carl Vincent Institute out of the University of Georgia uh, had a meeting with them this morning. And we're working through that and how to figure out uh, how to take uh, the, the academic tradition that we have here, but really make it relevant uh in the uh, new economies that are coming 
Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lack, how about for you? I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, in my district, um, you know, we've, we've got several challenges um, that are similar uh, to the ones in Fayette. Um, first of all, we view all our challenges as opportunities to grow and improve. Um, and uh, with respect to mathematics in particular, we have, uh, we're in year four of a, an adoption with uh, Pearson's Envision Math, uh, which is a great program. Um, and Dreambox provides an amazing alignment for that. Um, this is our, uh, as I said in the beginning, our district's first year of a full implementation in elementary school of Dreambox. And we've had this push for personalized instruction for some time now that meets every student's needs. Uh, um, and so um, that's the reason why we honestly adopted Envision Math a few years ago. We needed a program that would allow teachers to assign content, different content to different students within the same class um, based on individual needs. And to an extent, you know, Pearson realized their platform can help teachers accomplish that. But um, at the same time, there's limits within the platform that place limits on how teachers can personalize instruction. Um, for instance, there's uh, limited adaptivity in uh, that, that platform. It's driven mostly by the teacher's plans and the teacher's decisions. And so this is what has made Dreambox so appealing to us, that adaptive intelligent engine that uses constant form of assessment to push out the next best uh, lesson, uh, the next best question, and um, you know, more importantly, despite Envision, Envision Math's um, uh, framework being built on NCTM's approach to mathematical proficiency being equal parts, um, conceptual understanding, pr uh, procedural fluency, and reasoning and problem solving, um, what we notice for a, a variety of reasons is that in many of our elementary classrooms, um, procedural fluency gets the greatest degree of emphasis. And so, um, you know, Dreambox really helps us ensure that every student is getting a, a healthy balance of the conceptual understanding with the procedural fluency. Um, and that there's no way to circumvent that. Um, that's been a game changer for us. Um, so with Dreambox and Envision side by side, we get a nice balance of the procedural fluency conceptual understanding and the reasoning and problem solving. Um, and Dreambox just does a great job of getting our students to think flexibly. Um, we've been using number talks for many years now, but um, you know the degree to which those are implemented with fidelity and effectively in every classroom, um, it varies, right? And so Dreambox we see is sort of that equalizer that uh, allows every child to get those flexible number strategies with uh, nice visual supports. Um, and then one, one last thing, we, like a lot of districts around us, we've had a, a, a literacy push across disciplines lately. Um, and so we see student ownership as playing a huge role in personalized learning in our district. And so what that looks like in the elementary classroom oftentimes is um, students setting their own goals, tracking their progress, but also conferencing one-on-one um, -on -one or in small groups with teachers. So we've been doing that with English language arts more naturally, um, but we're starting to sort of um, investigate that with mathematics and we're using Dreambox as a tool for that. So um, uh, one of the things we're doing, we'll talk about, you know, here in a minute, is we're using some of the tools in Dreambox to help drive those personalized uh, student conferences. And so far um, it's working wonderful. Oh, excellent. If, if I may, I, let, let me jump back in and, and yes. just make a couple of comments because I, I went the 50,000 foot view. I maybe narrowed down just a little bit as far as some of the, uh, the concerns that we have in our district. I, we've uh, This is really our second full year of being one-to-one, one-to-one um, uh, -one district. Uh, some of the pushback of concerns that we've had uh, from our parents deal with uh, screen time. They think maybe sometimes our students have too much screen time and uh, technology may be being overused uh, by some of our teachers or, or some of our uh, in some of our content areas. I'd also note that um, as technology has expanded in, in schools, uh, there's been tremendous growth uh, in the educational content 
um, and um, in the market space. And for us to uh, really, uh, we want to find uh, those products that really um, uh, are uh, evidence-based that can really uh, uh, help us uh, yield the greatest impact, impact size, uh, the co uh, quote Hattie's research. We want to find those products that really we get the biggest bang for the puck. So that's that's one of the uh, some of the other problems that we're addressing. Uh, I, I think Brian makes some great points as far as drilling down into the math work itself, but um, certainly Brain um, uh, Dreambox is is one of those products that we have found to be very successful, and, and I think we've had it in in practice here after vetting it very carefully, I might add, for, over the last five years, and uh, we see some uh, wonderful results. Uh, at the elementary level, particularly. Yeah, Dr. Barrow, one question that came in, what's the, uh, uh, in addition to Dreambox, what's like the core print math program in your district? They use uh, Envision in uh, uh, Dr. Lack's district. How about in yours? Uh, we, um, you know, basically, and, and I know some people will uh, ask this question or make this comment, what we, uh, do is we take the Georgia standards of excellence and we really do push those standards primarily. So there are a host of other resource materials that we use uh, and bring to the table. So I'm not going to venture out and name one specific math program because we use a lot. Our goal is to make sure we cover those standards and we try to bring in as many different resources as we can. Uh, to help teachers do the best job in, in developing those standards effectively. No, very nice. Yeah, to something that um, you mentioned about parent concerns around screen time, when I was a math coordinator, one of the reasons we brought in, um, what, one of the problems to solve was that differentiation piece. I got a lot of calls from parents whose first grader was able to do third grade math with understanding, but they didn't qualify for gifted. And it's tough to ask the teacher to get resources to stretch the student up. And the other way too, that some first graders who were behind grade level and didn't qualify for special education. So they needed some differentiation tools and support. And uh, and one thing, I'm, I'm not sure if all the listeners on here know, the way Dreambox is, is used, it's basically one hour a week, like two 30 minute sessions or a few 20 minute sessions, knowing that it's in concert and in complementary, uh, it, it fills a complementary role with what's happening in the classroom because we don't believe all math should be on screens. And when we think a lot about screen time because we require that for students to be thinking and doing in math. And um, just with an hour a week, we, we, we find most parents are okay with that because it's also active for students, just like, when you go into a math classroom and uh, observe a teacher facilitating learning, you wanna see students being the ones who are asking the questions, the thinkers, the doers, uh, and you should expect the same of any screen time engagement as well. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. And for those of you on the line, um, the, uh, feel free to drop some questions in the chat or in the questions feature. And both of you have already spoken uh, to some, some ways that Dreambox, to, to the second part of this question about how Dreambox is helping. But what are some things um, uh, separate from Dreambox that, you are, that you're doing in your districts to improve the math program? I'll, I'll start with that. Um, just to continue with uh, the notion I was, I was talking about earlier about conferencing one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, you know, this being our first year of this, the Streambox implementation, our focus has really been on getting every student to meet that uh, weekly usage expectation that the research is clear, that we'll see the, the, the growth um, as a result of. And so, um, aside from that, though, um, we've also been uh, focused on helping teachers get comfortable using the inside dashboard. And, uh, Within that dashboard, the the overview reports and the activity feeds. Um, that's what our, our our teachers are using specifically to conference with students. Um, I was in a classroom a few weeks ago, and this is a, a really powerful story. Um, this is a kindergarten classroom where um, there were students, just like in your example in the very beginning, um, who were having issues with counting. Um, but then there were some students who were already studying rounding to the nearest ten, 
which is a third grade standard in our state. And so uh, the teacher was using the um, activity feed um, and the overview uh, reports to identify students who were who were struggling uh, with their lessons. And I watched her in a 10 minute span do a use the activity feed, the play lesson feature to do a one on one, a little bit of direct instruction um, and questioning with the student who was having trouble counting and the student who was having trouble conceptualizing rounding to the nearest 10. Um, so um, that's one example of how we're using Dreambox. Um, but to answer your question, one of the, the general approaches we are taking is, is getting back to that, um, you know, that, that practice of, of conferencing. You know, you have to know where your students are to uh, effectively reach them. And um, so that's, that's what we're really focused on right now in Forsyth. And I, I would say we've uh, really tried to stretch our uh, district, uh, math teachers included, uh, with our literacy standards. We, you know, we think there are literacy standards in mathematics as well. Uh, we've encouraged the, uh, uh, not just the, using the numbers, uh, but to also write about math and to be able to explain uh, what you did and what your understanding is. and. Uh, I think that's been been pretty powerful. Uh, Dreambox for us is is really been um, uh, something that uh, has taken off. Uh, I can go back and uh, our uh, math uh, district coordinator at that point in time. We just felt like we needed something more than you know the, the can math curriculum and. Uh, we began to look at different products that were in the market at that point in time. And um, uh, we came across Dreambox five years ago and thought that, you know, with uh, some of the AI pieces that it had, it was uh, able to help uh, students that needed to advance. It could if we needed to do some remediation, uh, it could be it could do that. It was more intuitive. Um, and I can also speak to this as uh, not just as an educator or superintendent, but as a parent. And I've got twins, uh, 13 years old, and uh, they're both very different, a boy and a girl. Um, the uh, girl is very much into the fine arts. The boy is very much into math, science, and STEM. And uh, Dreambox was able to work for both of them. Um, I know the, the gaming concept, particularly the boy, he's into that. Uh, loves to play computer games and, and those kinds of things. And uh, the fact that he could do that and win badges and awards and those kinds of things, that was challenging for him. Uh, he enjoyed that and he really was able to accelerate. And um, there was some competition between he and some of the other kids in the, in the school about, you know, where are you? How many lessons have you completed and that kind of stuff. So it was fun. Uh, but even for the kids who were not quite as proficient in math, uh, they were having fun with using the product as well. Um, and uh, when the teacher works with that and they have a program students engage in, I think that's one of the reasons why the gaming industry uh, uh, really could uh, be disruptive as far as the educational profession is concerned because they've got it licked. They know how to get the kids engaged and um, uh, regardless of the content, but certainly Dreambox with mathematics is very powerful. And one of the things that we we try to do is make sure we're not putting students in competition with each other around sort of where they're at in math because right. we're don't want to uh so yeah focusing on how many lessons you completed no matter where you're at in the curriculum you can be That's successful good. by completing more lessons mm -hmm. um i like what both of you mentioned about the importance of conferring and uh and conversations and communication in math those too often get overlooked in the way we're assessing students I think a lot about um, how, you know, I used to have parents sometimes, you know, would ask, why does my, you know, son or daughter need to show their work and explain their thinking? They can do it in their head and they're correct. And I would say, uh, would, would you like them to maybe be a lawyer someday? And the parents would say, oh yeah, that'd be good. And I'd say, do you, do you think you could, they could say, uh, your honor, uh, my client is innocent. I did it in my head, <laughs> that no matter what job you will ever have. There's gonna be written communication, justifying a case, uh, stating a position, backing it up, 
and uh, it's it's exciting to hear that you all are thinking of math as as that sort of uh, sort of thing. We had one question come in. Uh, both of you do use do you use Dreambox for all students in the districts? Um, is that right? It's not just intervention that you're using Dreambox for. That was one question that came in. Yep, we we use it for uh, all of our kids, um, and particularly in the elementary level, they uh, uh, they do have opportunities for. Uh, personalized time we uh, we do encourage the students to go through and and uh, uh, you know and I, I think any software program if, if the protocols are not adhered to uh, you know I did Dreambox 10 minutes today and I'm not seeing any improvement in math well that's it's not designed to do that you've got to be able to whether it's uh, read 180 or IXL or whatever the program is you You've got to be able to adhere to the protocols, and if you do, then I think you're going to see the growth that uh, uh, that the research shows can take place in in the whatever product you're using. Yeah, yeah, same here. Uh, K five, all students, and then targeted populations in middle school. All right, thank you. So uh, let's move on to next question which uh dr lack i'll let you take this one first you mentioned uh how some of the ways that you're driving agency and ownership with some of that conferring you want to expound on that a little bit yeah one of the things we're doing across disciplines is we're encouraging teachers to give students greater ownership in their learning paths by um identifying learning goals and then progress monitoring towards those goals. So uh, teachers practice this in a variety of ways with and without Dreambox. Um, but with Dreambox in particular, um, let's take an example of a, uh, a standard like on multi-digit addition subtraction. So we want students to, um, in order to be fluent, they need to be accurate, uh, flexible, and efficient with their strategies. Um, and we want them to choose the most appropriate strategies given a pair or set numbers. Um, and uh, there's a series, of less, a series of lessons that I'm thinking about on Dreambox where um, students are given expressions and they are to look at those, analyze those, and determine which strategy would be most appropriate. Uh, the jumper, captain compensation, the amazing algorithm, etc. cetera. Um, and they, the goal is to compute, compute the, um, uh, is to compute the problem, evaluate the expressions in the least number of steps. Um, so the students can monitor their progress uh, towards that goal, especially in cases where teachers have um, used assigned focus with a long-term assignment uh, in assigned focus. But also, um, we've had we've encouraged our parents to um, sign up for access to the to the dashboard, the family dashboard, where um, they can also progress their monitor uh, their uh, children's um, progress towards specific. Uh, learning goals. So um, we also have students monitor their own usage and record that, whether it's in a data log um, or some other way. And so um, those are you know, two specific examples of how we're trying to develop ownership in students. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, absolutely key to really pushing student learning and student growth is, uh, and they help to develop their own uh, performance learning targets and uh, I, that can be done in, in a math journal it can be done on a dashboard uh, but uh, periodically as, as Brian said progress monitoring uh, is is really good you know response to intervention uh, is not just for kids in remediation it's for gifted kids as well and if you can uh, help a student understand you know where they are and where they want to be in a certain period of time uh, they're more likely apt to hit the target and um, I think it's a great way to challenge um, the, the math journals I know a lot of our teachers use those uh, and, and students are able to write out their thinking in addition to the, uh, uh, the, the equations that they're working with um, uh, we um, we really encourage that in the district, and, and but in multiple content areas, not just in math. Yeah, there's there's sort of two analogies I think of, just reflecting on times when I had agency myself and how maybe as schools we could do uh, do a better job of providing that to students. One is just going back to that um, 
that unmedicated childbirth class. Like we had agency to get into the class uh, and we felt ownership over the whole thing. The problem was I didn't have agency and ownership over the learning, the big ideas that maybe, maybe they should have the very first, maybe the first uh, class should have been, let's watch these videos and be like, all right, Tim, pause. What are you gonna do here? You know, and I'd be like, uh, take some medication. And they'd be like, wrong. You know, like activate that prior knowledge, put me in that situation where I have to have an original thought of my own on the matter. We need to activate that prior knowledge, get kids intuition. It's kind of like uh, the other analogy is uh, Home Depot. Like, I feel like kids experience math like someone who does not have any home project to do experiences Home Depot. Well, let's just walk you through each aisle and look at each little widget and bolt and piece of piping and what it does. No, everyone who goes to Home Depot has a project in mind. It's you can do it, we can help. And if our, you know, we can drive agency with students for it, in the ways that you both just mentioned that math is a place you're going in order to do something, in order to have some ideas, have things occur to you and, uh, and not a place where math is just happening to you. So uh, I appreciate those specific ideas. Well, and, and another approach too to, to think about, um, you know, in, in our traditional practice, uh, we've always, uh, time has been the variable we focused on with seat time, and Carnegie unit and those kinds of things there. And what we've really uh, encouraged our teachers and by extension, our students is, uh, you know, uh, learning really should be the constant and time is the variable and uh, kids through uh, software applications they can learn 24 7 I think we're really naive in today's world to think the only time a, a young person learns is when they're in front of a, uh, the teachers in the front of the class and that's when they learn it's the only time they can learn and I, I think that's absolutely incorrect I think they can learn 24 7 uh, and that's what uh, the software and software programs like Greenbox can do. Kids can do that at home and can accelerate or remediate as, as their needs dictate. Anything to add, Dr. Lack? Uh, Dr. Lack, before we move on? Yeah, um, we, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of the same things. Uh, learning targets are, are big and just, um, you know, breaking down the the uh, the math learning trajectories and progressions and student friendly terms and uh, giving students agency in that process. Um, and like I said, Dreambox has been one tool that has uh, assisted us in in accomplishing those goals. Right. Moving on to next question. This is a little more about uh, start by talking about technology in general because you've both talked about the promise of technology, of different gaming protocols, of engagement and things. But there's a reality on the ground that you need, you know, you need internet, you need devices, you need updated software, you're managing a ton of applications, you got to get students roster. Like there's a whole slew of things that, um, uh, Dr. Barrow, I'll have you start because you mentioned the one to one initiative and how long has that been going? How's, uh, how's the rollout been? What are some of the, uh, just to that first question there, you know, how easy or difficult is it to just incorporate technology in general? Yep. Um, and, and I think that's something that we're continuing to learn. We, as I said earlier, we have uh, started the one-to-one -one initiative uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, we secured funding through our educational SPLOST and um, that uh, allowed us to purchase a lot of what we call connected classrooms. And it's, it's uh, certainly a personal device for each student and each teacher, but also um, audio, audio enhancement. And, and uh, we have a Promethean board and uh, all of our instructional workspaces. So a lot of opportunities to integrate technology, but I, I say this fairly frequently, and I'm sure somebody else, uh, I'm quoting somebody, I'm not sure who it is, but I really don't believe technology is ever going to replace a highly qualified, highly competent teacher. Uh, I think it can do a lot to augment and support and um, help students uh, move forward in an independent fashion, but uh, 
the quality classroom teacher still really is at the heart and soul of what we do. Um, but that's a that's a learning curve for our adults. You know, even for me, I'm still learning about technology myself. And uh, so professional learning is is huge. Uh, it's easy to put a device in front of somebody. Uh, it's much more difficult to show them how that device can actually enhance learning and teaching. And uh, uh, the implementation, you know, with Dreambox actually uh, basically came in almost at the same time uh, as our one-to-one -one initiative. And so they were kind of hand in hand and Dreambox is fairly intuitive and easy to learn. And, and uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, folks came to it so quickly. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, same experience in my district. Um, and I, I'd like to just reiterate what Dr. Barrow said. We had Forsyth County um, News come and do a piece on our implementation in one of our schools. And um, one of the things that I said in the article right away is that technology cannot replace um, a high quality classroom teacher. Um, I, I think, I mean, based on my observation, uh, if the technology is there, it is, and, and, and the buy-in is there from teacher, the will is there from teachers, um, it's it's pretty simple, pretty easy to incorporate and integrate uh, the technology. Um, the vast majority of our teachers use Dreambox during their math lessons, their, during their math blocks, uh, during, during small group differentiated uh, instruction, or that portion of the lessons where students are um, expected to practice what they've learned or spiraling content. Um, they've been exposed to or even previewing new content. Um, the coolest thing ever, though, about the implementation this year is I've been in several classrooms where I've observed teachers teaching an introductory unit on fractions. And as the student is saying, or as the teacher asks, what, what, what is it that you guys know about fractions? I'm seeing more students than ever say, well, we already know how to partition fractions because we've done it in Dreambox or um, just recently a lesson on um, expressions in the order of operations, students raised their hand and said, we're, we're already doing this in Dreambox and it's so cool and it's so challenging. So um, uh, the, the implementation so far has been great. We know that we still have work to do though, because um, our analysis has shown that on average, our students are meeting the five lessons a week. But when you dig beneath the averages, we have a little bit of uh, variance that I'm sure every district does. We've got so many kids that are exceeding um, the, that five lessons a week are meeting, and we've got that's kind of covering up some of the students who are not. And so um, we're working on as our implementation right now. Our goal is to identify those students who are not getting their five lessons in a week, and seeing how we can uh, support that and make that happen. Um, some of our schools do use uh, Dreambox for homework as needed. Um, we've been very careful about um, the, the message and the expectations we've sent in this district about homework, you know, the need for it to be purposeful, which I think Dreambox clearly helps, um, and, and that we're giving students a reasonable amount of homework because it's very important that we, you know, that they have lives outside of school and we want them to connect with their families and, and things like that. So um, at the end of the day, we, um, we're really just focused on making sure, again, we hit that five lessons a week so that we can get that bump and growth that the research has well, uh, has clearly shown. And uh, what's less important is exactly when and, and, and where they do the lessons. Um, so, so far, everything has gone very, very well. Yeah, that's good to hear. I remember when, when we rolled out uh, Greenbox years ago in my district, there was there was just a lot of things going on contract negotiations new teacher evaluation model uh new technology devices we were doing this end computing thing where each classroom would have eight computers it's it's a lot for teachers to juggle and trying to figure out the ways to uh to, to make it simple make it manageable and i think definitely agree with both of you um we the place of the teacher is critical and that's why we only ask for an hour a week and averages do lie. I'm really glad that you're digging in uh, to the data because that's you, you need to make sure, uh, as both of you know, uh, equity, especially with device and internet access, is an important thing that we need to control what we can control in our schools to make sure that opportunity and access, uh, yeah, is, is given to all students. 
So uh, last piece here, you both uh, have mentioned high quality teachers and we know that uh, learning is not something that is only what students are doing. We know professional learning, professional development are key to uh, growing as a professional educator. So talk a little bit about how professional development um, is fitting in with your move to personalized learning and, and to improve your math program. And this will probably be the last question that we have time for. So um, if you have any last thoughts, anyone who's uh, attending, drop something in the chat. And uh, Dr. Lack, let's go to you first on this one. You're on, you're on mute. <laughs> no worries. Thanks. Uh, yes, the PD obviously makes all the difference in the world. Uh, during our activation training with Dreambox, a PD specialist um, shared some powerful data on the correlation between Dreambox usage and professional development. Basically, what it showed is that um, usage skyrockets uh, for students and teachers uh, in precisely the time that a structured and explicit targeted PD is offered. Um, and that's what we've seen in our schools. Um, we've gone out and supported our coaches in the buildings and our, 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 our schools. And we've seen that right after that PD happens, we see a surge um, in usage and also in the innovative ways that people are using um, Dreambox to personalize uh, learning. Low usage is typically not a function of disinterested teachers. It's more about um, not knowing what you don't know. Um, and then, uh, you know, last but not least, um, our superintendent uh, has done a fantastic job of helping to clarify and reiterate um, the, ex the expectations of Dreambox usage with respect to our personalized learning uh, goals in the district. And uh, every time he visits schools, he always asks how the implementation is going. And, um, you know, a simple act like that makes a, a really huge difference. I, I would agree. I, I know uh, Jeff, Dr. Bearden very well and, and uh, is absolutely doing a great job there in Forsyth. And um, I, I think a lot of things do start with leadership at the top. And, you know, I'm not in the classroom on a day to day basis. Uh, and, and we use the analogy there. There are really two types of employees in our district. Uh, we have classroom teachers on one side and everybody else on the other side. And if you're not in a classroom teaching, you need to be supporting those that are. I mean, that's our focus, that's our emphasis. Uh, and one way we try to support our teachers is uh, clearly defined, uh, very intentional, very purposeful professional development, professional learning. I, I think that's one area I know people uh, talk about, well, you know, there's some research that says it's, it, you, you can have professional development, but if there's no follow-up, it's wasted money. And I tend to agree with that. So um, we try to do that in, in, uh, have in small groups. I think that's very effective when you can do that, uh, certainly on, at a school base or a grade level, so that teachers can actually collaborate and work together. I think sometimes our teachers are our best uh, professional developers. Uh, they understand the, the work that has to go on and and certainly the problems that uh, come about. And uh, we use our teachers a lot in helping to teach our teachers. I, I think that's uh, very important, very meaningful. Um, I think uh, I think when we have quality professional development and, and adults understand what we're trying to accomplish and, and to achieve, there's typically less pushback uh, from them, from the parents, uh, um, from the students even there. People understand a little bit better. And uh, I think it's Covey that says, you know, seek first to understand and then be understood. Well, we really try to understand where our teachers are and what they're doing. Uh, and this is just another tool in our toolbox. And uh, uh, Dreambox has been uh, an amazing tool for us uh, in our elementary school. And we've been very pleased um, I, uh, I do try to get as, uh, as superintendent as, as many uh, uh, pieces of data that I can to help uh, verify uh, usage and progress. And because if you don't inspect what you expect, chances are you're not going to get what you want. And um, uh, so it's important and um, uh, it takes time to build that kind of trust. And, you know, when you ask questions, how, how's it going? 
uh, I believe our teachers talk to us now and they actually tell us exactly how it is going and uh, that comes over time and uh, uh, I think we've got uh, very strong people here. Our professional development is a good part of our program here. Yeah, you need to inspect what you expect. Yeah, that uh, what you're monitoring and measuring is what gets valued, uh, what shows your priorities. So good thoughts there. Well, we are now at, uh, at time. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and wrap it up and just say thank you on behalf of all of us uh here at Greenbox, we were just thrilled dr barrow dr lack thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise for those of you who attended and joined uh appreciate your interest in this topic and your participation we had a couple great questions so thank you very much i uh yeah on behalf of Greenbox, we thank you for your time and hope you have an incredible day dr barrow dr lack any final words um i, I think uh I would say this, if, if you're interested and you have a, your district here in Georgia or elsewhere and you uh, uh, have an interest in seeing the program implemented, we're happy to have guests and visitors. Uh, I think that's how we learn. So if you come visit us and you've got something that's of interest to us, we want to come visit you. That's how we learn. And uh, we'd open, open that uh, to any of, any of our uh, professional colleagues. Oh, thank you. That's great. Yeah, ditto for me. And if anybody out there is watching and you know just wants to chat um, more about uh, what we've learned in our Dreambox implementation, um, yeah, reach out to us. All right. Thank you all for your time. Don't forget to wash your hands. <laughs> Take Multiple care. Times. Multiple <laughs> times. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Right, thank you.